so this is really a broad intersectional agenda. Um, do you want to speak to that? And, and, and how do we get it? Okay, so um, we're mentioning wars, we're mentioning news and media. Um, during World War II, the New York Times posted daily headlines telling people even the minute details, like what soldiers were doing. Yeah. The war that's heading our way will kill, affect, disproportionately um, cause suffering more than any war that has come to pass. Um, it will cause hunger, it will cause pain, and the kind of pain will not be able to be medicated with immediate medicine. Right. It's going to be starvation. And so what's heading our way is, if not the biggest issue humanity faces. That's why we have these very specific demands. That's why our, our actions are so dramatic. We, we cannot work against the media or the sources of information that are available to people. We need, we need them as much as they need us. Mm. We need to be working in hand with the quote unquote liberal progressive medias. We're not asking, for example, Fox News to change its agenda. We're asking for the New York Times to put it on its headlines. We're asking for the Washington Post to put it on its headlines. The, the people that claim to be um, for justice, for social movements, it's your time to do it. We're and as we know, it's a media ecosystem in which there is also independent media like ours. Um, I had a dear friend that always said it was the independent media that brings issues to the boil and the mainstream that inhales the steam. Um, so in the spirit of that, here's our report from the um, climate strikes of this October and some of the actions of Extinction Rebellion. Carrie Fulton. I am a policy fellow with the Climate Justice Alliance. I'm also a National Urban Fellow. So we're really happy here at the Climate Justice Youth Summit. Uh, this is the seventh one. It's very exciting to be here because you're looking at young people from all over the country and even really the world that are gathering together to discuss climate justice and what that means and how we're all directly impacted and connected. You know what? Let's do a quick chat. Y'all ready for a chat? I can't hear y'all. Y'all ready for a chat? So my name is Naisha Mallet. I'm a climate justice youth organizer at Uprose Brooklyn, woo. Um, so today is the Climate Justice Youth Summit, which is something that we've been doing over the past 10 years. Um, it's usually the largest gathering of young people of color to come to learn and talk about climate change and climate justice and what a just transition looks like and what solutions we want to put forth um, to solve the problem. This year, we're doing it in September around the Climate Week. It's the two year anniversary of Maria. And we we also know that yesterday was a whole bunch of climate strikes that was happening up in New York and across the world and this is our frontline climate strike, frontline leadership from the youth and across the world. Hi, my name is Chelsea. I'm an artist and youth organizer with Uprose. How I'm connected to the summit is that I was the artist um, behind all the art and I also was one of the lead organizers at the summit. In any movement, the things could feel really heavy. And I feel like art really helps people, um, people's hearts to get connected. Because if your heart's not in it, you're not going to stay in it. I just cannot help but tell you that the future is bright. Because you are all invested, like so many generations before you, to fight for justice. When we saw four million people around the world Young people missing class, missing lessons in the classroom because they were about to teach us a lesson that what it takes is leadership and courage. It is up to you because as many of you have said, there is not planet B and we are all in this together. Talk about the way that we tell this history, Libro, because I'm thinking to myself, you know, 
you two are great, and I'm reminded of the movements that I was part of in my teens, which were saying some of the same things about nuclear conflagration. I went and camped out at the Greenham Common Women's Air Force, you know, women's encampment protesting U.S. Air Force um, missile, cruise missiles, and we felt that same sense of urgency. And the story that is told of the 80s is, well, that was just a kind of, you know, explosion of activism. But it also led to a non-proliferation treaty. The cruise missiles had to be removed. You saw a, a difference in the a nuclear discussion because of people, especially women and young people, speaking from our hearts. Um, and yet, you, but it goes back to the story because the story is told that this stuff maybe worked once in the civil rights movement. Sure. But it's not true. It has worked. It does work, and I think the challenge for any movement is how do you zero in on a strategy to get to these bold demands? Right. I mean, these four demands that were laid out are huge, they're massive. The, the thing that prevents us from getting there is the lack of power. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, nonviolent direct action, civil disobedience, these are tactics. They have to be deployed in a power building strategy. Mm -hmm. How do we? Meaning? Meaning we have to grow organizations, we have to grow institutions, we have to um, win some victories. People don't stay in movements where you lose all the time. Right. Um, and I think that that's one of the challenges is to use these dramatic actions as an educational uh, and media moment but then to capture that moment, you have to build organization and build infrastructure. So give us an example of where you think that's happened, and then I'd love to hear from you how it's happening where you are. Well, I think that, you know, examples of that is where people build local organizations. The climate strike was not just a, a you know, a single flash in the pan event. It actually built local high school committees. It built local structures. Um, and to the extent that those continue, and that they build over time and aren't about one event, then that is, shows the ability to actually win some victories. Um, we can't just also, we can't just have demands, we have to have clear targets. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges is like, who are we demanding this yeah. from? And how do we put pressure on those targets? Because um, that's an important principle of organizing, is we have to figure out who can give us this win and how do we actually make it worth their while? Giovanni, do you have answers to any of those questions? The fact of the matter is that nonviolent direct action works. Erika Chenoweth, one of the leading scholars on how to bring about radical political change, says that we don't have any more excuses anymore. We know what is the most effective strategy and tool to power build and create a structural change in society, and that is nonviolent direct action. Mm -hmm. it's, very, it's very straightforward. If you can get 3.5% of the population mobilized in sustained resistance, nonviolent resistance, you can bring about a radical political change in a very, very short time scale. And so this is exactly. Need, you don't need millions of people. You don't you need millions 3. of people. You need 3.5% of the population in question, which yeah. I guess would in maybe be a million City, in the US. In New York City, it's around 280,000 people. Yeah. Um, but in terms of victories, I think I am quite on board with uh, Libero um, because um, at our last movement, we got the New York City. Uh, the city government to declare a climate emergency. Um, I've had the privilege of organizing with the strikers. Uh, I was one of the 15 students in New York City who led 315,000 people out of school and onto their street, onto the street. And absolutely, the movement um, required a coalition. It required seeds in every school in New York City. We provided the students with resources, and then we let them do with those resources what they would. And they created affinity groups. They created a community. I mean, XR uh, prides itself in its community building yeah. orientation. Um, we have the youth, and then we have uh, uh, groups of neighborhood groups. We have Flatbush group. We have a uh, um, upper North Manhattan group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the reason why XR would say that our movement is working is because it's not one arbitrary action. It's day after day after day, one 
group of co one cohort of people gets arrested, another comes in and takes their place. Which again is another media myth that it's just the action in the street or that the action in the street is not connected to the organizing, even by virtue of a person yeah. who is doing both.